Dr. Gary Habermas is the distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Philosophy and Theology at Liberty University. He holds a PhD in philosophy and in history and has authored nearly 40 books, over 100 articles, and has spoken on over 100 campuses across the US and abroad. He's also debated some of the top atheists in the world, including uh, the late philosopher Anthony Flew. In one such debate over the resurrection of Christ before 3,000 people, five philosophers and five professional debate judges judged the debate. Of the philosophers who judged on the content of the, of the debate, four voted in favor of Habermas, and the other was undecided. Of the debate judges on the technique, three voted in Habermas's favor, while the other two voted for Flew. Uh, if you've got further interest, the debate was published uh, as a book under the title Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? The Resurrection Debate. Uh, very interestingly, prior to Flew's conversion from atheism to uh, theism in 2004, on account of what he considered to be new scientific evidence for God, he suggested that he thought Bertrand Russell himself would want to re-examine the evidence where he's still alive. Habermas, a personal friend of Anthony Flew, very good friends in fact, and someone who has wrestled with skepticism himself, is recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on historical Jesus and resurrection research. Uh, his lecture tonight, The Resurrection Evidence That Changed a Generation of Scholars, will be followed by a Q&A time from the audience. Please welcome Dr. Gary Habermas. It's hard to see with these lights, but it looks like we've got a really good crowd here. Oh, up in the balcony, too. Hello to all of you. I'm going to step over here. I'm not crazy about lecterns. Um, let me introduce my topic. I'm going to introduce my method that I'm going to use tonight. And then the rest of the lecture, I have to keep a close watch on my watch here for your sakes. There we go. I want to mark off a timeline. I have a PowerPoint for this, but I quit using it. The reason I quit using it is the whole lecture, once I get started, is going to be marching off a timeline, and I think the PowerPoint would just subtract from it. I was doing this at Oxford, actually, a couple years ago, and I made that same comment. And a guy came up to me and he said, he said, you don't need a PowerPoint, you're a human PowerPoint. Well, I'm probably going to be like that, but I'm going to keep moving back and forth until you get the so you can get the point. I'm basically, there's going to be some exceptions, but basically I'm going to be marking off a time frame of just 25 years. Okay. Let me introduce my talk this way. The, the, probably the point I try to get across to folks the most, even grad students, I have to say this over and over because it's a really hard point to grasp, I mean to, the nuances. But I'll say something like, tonight I'm going to use two texts. And those two texts are from two New Testament books, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the end of Galatians 1, the beginning of Galatians 2. In the originals, there's no chapter and verse uh, breaks. So it's two texts. And people will often say to me, ah, no fair, you're using the New Testament. Okay. If you're interested, you could pursue this during the Q&A, and it's one of the sessions for first thing in the morning. I could back most of these points up and use nothing but ancient secular writers. So if you're pleased to go that way and you like those sources, I can give you those too. Secular writers, non-Christian. But let me tell you why I use 1 Corinthians and Galatians. Because these two sources and several others are allowed by virtually everybody in the critical community. Now if you say, well, my favorite website doesn't allow them, what you're telling me is they're not specialists in the field. Now there are, there are a couple of exceptions, almost none. For example, I just finished a debate with a British New Testament scholar. I think he's an atheist. He's a professor of New Testament. We did this for Oxford University Press. And I started and, and went, my argument starts from those same two texts. Now I've seen him debate, I've seen him talk. He does not even question this move. That's because of how good the data are for 1 Corinthians and Galatians 4. So just to say, well, you're using the New Testament doesn't address the issue. So does virtually every atheist, agnostic, skeptic, moderate, conservative, evangelical, they all do the same. In fact, here's an example. Michael Martin, the very well-known atheist, who wrote a couple books, The Case Against Christianity, 
In the case for atheism, so you know where he's coming from, he says this in one part in his book. He says, the best source we have for the resurrection, for a resurrection appearance, is the Apostle Paul, because he's the only eyewitness we have. Now, what's he talking about? Well, you can read the article, but he's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's an atheist who's arguing against Christianity and for atheism. Why is it a starting point? Well, let me, let me just give a few comments. Paul has 13 books with his name on it. Most skeptics, let's go to the you know, left side of the spectrum here, they're going to grant six to eight books that Paul wrote. They're going to say, I'll give you six of them as being authoritative. A lot of you know the name Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman will concede all six to eight of these books. In fact, get his introduction to the New Testament. You can see this for yourself. Why those books? Well, they think analysis of language, uh, the reoccurrence of certain terms, when they were written, etc., determines which ones are authentic and which ones aren't. First Corinthians is often said to be the most authoritative New Testament epistle for this reason. It can be dated by archaeological sources. In fact, here's one commentary. It's a critical, it's a, it's a skeptical, critical commentary on my shelf. You pull it out, you look up 1 Corinthians, you look up author, and here's what it says. The authorship of this epistle is so well established, we don't even have to argue it here. The author is Paul, and it moves on. That's how well, so, so I'm just saying all this because people will hear me do this and they'll say, oh, your whole lecture is suspect because you're using the New Testament. My point is, every specialist uses the same text. There's virtually nobody who doesn't if they specialize. There's one or two exceptions, but I mean, I've been compiling a bibliography of the major sources on resurrection since 1975, French, German, and English, my, number, my source is now numbered between 33 and 3,400. I can think of maybe, that I know of right off the top of my head, one guy who's going to dispute what I just told you. One out of 3,300 sources. That's how much of a given this is. Michael Martin's a good example of an atheist, Bart Ehrman, of an agnostic who can see this. Okay, enough. But again, if you're interested in secular sources, you will try this on me and, and cite a secular source if some of you want to do that during the Q&A, we can do that too. All right, so what's my method? That was just an introduction. My method is this. If this book, this is a nondescript, title worn off New Testament. If this book is as the Christians here tonight say it is, and it's inspired, then guess what? Jesus was raised from the dead. I, I think that's a given. What if it's not inspired, and it's, um, kind of a middle-of-the-road, middle-of-the-road plus. It's just kind of a fairly reliable text, but it's not inspired. Jesus is raised from the dead. You go, well, what if it's an unreliable book, like I believe, you know, some of you who are here. What if it's an unreliable book? Jesus is still raised from the dead. Bottom line, whichever view you have of the text, you can get to the resurrection. Well, that doesn't even make sense. How are you going to do that? What I'm going to do is use skeptical data. I'm not going to use the whole arsenal of arguments that evangelicals will use. That's too conservative for some of you. I will use skeptical data. And the data I use tonight will have two characteristics. It will be conceded by the vast majority of scholars who do this research. You say, well, what's the vast majority? 90 to 100 percent. Many of the things I cite will be 95, 97. You go, well, come on, you're being overly specific. How do you know that? Because I've done the counting. I've done the head count. So I can, I can count the folks and give you a rundown. If you're interested in most of these questions, I can tell you about how many people lie on each side of the issue, just because this is the big bibliography I've done. And uh, just lining up where the scholars are on my computer is about 600 pages. Not commenting, not critiquing, not going after, just listing their positions over 600 pages. Could be another doctoral dissertation. Should have submitted this at Michigan State instead of the one I did. Um, by the way, I did the resurrection at Michigan State, and I had people on my committee who did not believe it. 
and they were very, very fair about it. They said, you can give good evidence, you get your degree. You know, it's not what we believe, but you give some good arguments, you get out of here. We're not going to judge you by whether we like what you're doing or not. Okay, so I'm going to use critical data. I'm going to give you an article that is uh, an argument that has rocked a generation of scholars. And this is why, let me just use an example of a friend of mine, a New Testament scholar who's frequently called a skeptic. His name's Dale Allison. He teaches in Pit at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And uh, critics love him. He's, he's quite a skeptic, comes up with some really critical views. But get this, you say, Dale, what do you, I, he and I had a dialogue, and we've gotten to be friends. Dale, what do you believe about the resurrection of Jesus? You're skeptic. Here's a paraphrase from one of the sentences of his book on the resurrection. I have no doubt that Jesus' disciples saw him again after his death. That's a skeptic. How's that a skeptic? That's where, new, where scholarship is moved, being forced by some of this data. Now, I'm going to get to a point in the lecture where I'll tell you where when we get there. I won't be able to explain it, because the point, because it'll take way too long. So you can question it, or you can come tomorrow morning, because I'm doing part of a lecture on this tomorrow morning. I'm unpacking one of the points. So, all right. So I'm using skeptical data and using their arguments alone. Okay. Let me start like this. If you ask the average Christian, how do you know Jesus was raised from the dead? You get an answer like this for most Christians. Okay. I'm going to call this ground zero, okay? This is 30 AD. A minority of scholars will say 33 AD, but just because it's a nice round number, let's say 30 AD, this is the day of the crucifixion. And we're going that way, okay? So that's creation, that's 2011. And you say, how do you know Jesus was raised from the dead? The average evangelical argues like this on this timeline. Well, have you heard about the Gospel of Mark? I'll use critics dating, okay? I'll use critical dating. It's only about 65 or 70 AD, subtract 30. So it's only 35 to 40 years after the cross. Again, I'm using critical dating. Matthew, about 10 years later. Luke, about five years later. And John, everybody dates, about 95 AD. So the average Christian is going to go, give me Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. John 95, so track 30, plus 65 years. Only 65 years later. And every once in a while, we're actually with, with non-specialists, a few specialists, you're going to get this complaint. Come on. Plus 65? Man. There's a lot of chance to blow it at plus 65. I'm thinking you need to study ancient historiography. Historiography is not modern historiography. Let's take two other persons from the ancient world. Let's ask, what do we know about Alexander the Great? Okay. New timeline. Here's Alexander's death. What are earliest sources? We have about five folks who wrote contemporary sources of Alexander. That's fantastic. Every one of them's lost. We have five other sources. And the first one, <laughs> get the point? The two best known sources for Alexander are Arian and Plutarch, both over 400 years after this point. 400 years later. You go, well, a few of them are earlier than that. Yes, they are, by just a little bit, and they don't tell anything like the amount of information that Plutarch and Arian tell. Well, that's not a very good example, okay? If it's that bad, pick a different example. Let's do that. Back to Jesus. 30 or 33, let's say 30 AD. Tiberius Caesar, 
who is the Caesar on the throne when Jesus dies. We know that from ancient secular sources. Tiberius Caesar dies 37 AD. So he's contemporary of Jesus's. And we have about nine sources for Tiberius. Okay, now you're talking. Nine sources. Four major sources for Tiberius. The first one is contemporary. And you skeptics go, <laughs> beat that. First one's contemporary. Okay, that's good. That's a good source for sure. Unfortunately, this source is the least usable of the four sources. More about that, but it's a great source. No putting it down. Good source. Next best source for Tiberius. Tacitus, about 118 AD, plus 80. So John is too late at 65, but Tacitus and the next guy, from whom we get the most information about Tiberius, Suetonius, they are plus 80 and plus 85. The fourth one, Dio Cassius, at plus 180. But John's way too late at 65. Now that sounds to me like playing fast and loose with the data. If you say John's too late at 65, you go a little bit. Here's the difference. The Gospels record miracles. What about these ancient histories? Virtually every one of them record miracles. Prophecies, portents, dreams, healings. In fact, Tacitus says he knows a couple people who were healed by one of the Roman emperors. Now, Tacitus is very careful. Suetonius is a lot, is a lot more open. I mean, he's writing in 120 AD, and he talks about Augustus Caesar, Caesar Augustus, and he says, Caesar Augustus's mother was a virgin and he was the son of one of the gods. Oh, and his table of contents, Suetonius' 12 Caesars, 12 Caesars, and after five of their names, it says these two words, later deified, later deified, later deified, later deified, and later deified. Five out of 12. You say, well, okay, all right, so there's some muddling here. That's why all ancient historians are stupid or something like that. But you can't say that because so much of what we allow depends on our sources. And the latest research, for the first time, when I went to school back in the early 70s, I was told, don't ever say the Gospels are biographies. Don't call them Greco-Roman bio. That changed about 1990 with the University of London classic scholar who argued that if you compare the sources, the Gospels are they're, the, they're very, very similar to Greco-Roman biographies like the ones we've been talking about, Plutarch's famous lives, or Arian, or these others. And so you say, well, all right, but you're still going to have to convince me. Okay, just on the surface, what I'm saying is the New Testament is, is very much comparable, better than almost any other sources. You say, yeah, but they're still doing religious propaganda. Well, guess what? What about Suetonius, five Caesars later deified? What about moralizing? What about people who tell stories or have battles in ancient Rome in order to get a moral point across, which some of them say they do? What I'm saying is a lot of writers in the ancient world, they have other agendas. But you can't say, I mean, you can say it, but it doesn't help to say they all fabricated. That doesn't help. By the way, Thucydides is one of the only ancient writers who doesn't really include the supernatural, the Greek historian. Okay, so again, the question I was asking is, what would the average Christian say about resurrection? I think they would argue for the reliability of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. That's not the argument I'm gonna to use tonight. I'm showing you an alternate path that some people take to answer this question. I'm gonna use a path that virtually, the one I outlined already for you, 
that virtually all critical scholars will allow you to make, if they're specialists, if they know what they're doing, if they know the state of the research. And they're going to say, like Michael Martin said, put your best foot forward. Your best foot is Paul. Because there's six to eight books. They're authoritative. And, and, and what's authoritative mean? Authoritative mean, means we know the author. He was a scholar. I mean, I would say in today's, in a, today, by today's credentials, you'd probably say Paul or Saul of Tarsus had a PhD in Old Testament. I mean, that's the way you talk about him. He was, he was a person who had risen ahead of his class, outdistanced his colleagues. He was the one who began his career by persecuting the church. He says himself in a few different passages that I took prisoner or worse, men, women, women and children who named the name of Christ. And then he says uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, both 9-1 and 1 Corinthians 15, 9-1 and 15-8, he says, I saw the risen Jesus. Now, so he's a scholar. He's at the right place, right time. You have to take his material seriously, and everyone does. Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to make this same argument. I'm going to start back here. This is Jesus in about 30 AD, and I'm going to go to Paul, and now I'm going to, from now on, this timeline is going to be just 25 years. Okay, so I'll, I'll stretch it out just a little bit, and I'll say, this is the writing of 1 Corinthians. That's 25 years. Well, when do you date 1 Corinthians? It doesn't make any difference. If you're liberal, conservative, skeptical, evangelical, it makes no difference. Everybody puts 1 Corinthians about 53 to 58 AD. Some very liberal people put it very early. Some conservatives put it late. But a nice average is 55. Minus 30, that's your 25 years. 25 years. Paul starts out 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 like this. He says, when I came to you, Corinthians, I preached the gospel to you. Okay, footnote. What's the gospel? Whenever the gospel, and I'm asking about the historical content of the good news, the Evangelion, the good news of the Christian proclamation, whenever you ask what's the, the historical content, however else gospel is defined in the New Testament, these three beliefs are always present. Jesus is deity. You heard one of the professors say, son of God. Secondly, died. Literally, it's not hard. We all die. Raised from the dead. That's tough. Okay? That's the minimum gospel data. Deity, death, resurrection. Now, sometimes other things are mentioned. Paul says buried a couple times. He says born of a woman a couple times. But he doesn't mention these. I guess the born of the woman thing, I think he's contrasting human, the classic Christian, born of a woman, son of God, giving the classic shot at the two natures. That's my guess. But once he mentions, well, he implies that the tomb was empty. But he doesn't do that real often. The three that stay there all the time, that's my footnote. When you see gospel, it's at least the belief that Jesus was the son of God, deity, died on the cross by Roman crucifixion, was raised from the dead. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, when I came to you, I preached the gospel. And those of you who trusted it, accepted it, believed it, there's different Greek words. The Greek word, by the way, that's usually translated believe or faith, pastuo, is a very strong term. It means to, to trust, to cast yourself upon, to surrender. Contrary to what a lot of evangelicals say, it's not a magical repeating of, 20 words, and nothing ever changes in your life. It's a life change conditioned upon that kind of a commitment. But it means, again, to rely upon, to trust, to surrender, to walk along with. A couple times New Testament writers say, walk in his steps. All right, back to Paul. He says, this is the gospel I gave you. If you believed it, trusted, committed yourself, you've changed. He says, you're Christian. And if you didn't, you're not. Pretty simple. First two verses. Then he says in verse 3, it starts like this. He said, for I gave you 
what I was given as of first importance. That's a very important phrase. And this is the phrase that I want to talk about tomorrow, but I'll outline just a little bit here. I gave you what I was given as of first importance. That Jesus, he says that Christ, Jesus isn't mentioned here, he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And then here comes a list of appearances. He said he appeared to Peter. And in this list, there are three individuals, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and then Paul adds his own name to the end of the list. Verse 8, last of all, he appeared to me. And there are three groups in this list. A group called the Twelve, which is the name for the Twelve, even though Judas is dead by now. The Twelve. All the Apostles, which scholars say, well, I don't know, it's got to be a group bigger than Twelve, but exactly who he's talking about is tough. And then he says over 500 of the brothers, over 500 men at one time, so that, that should, could be 800 or 1,000 people, who knows, but a, but a big group. And those are the three groups, three individuals. If there's a unanimous conclusion in the New Testament, close to it, it's that this list Paul is giving is what we might call an early creedal statement. There are a lot of synonyms, early creedal statement, early tradition, early confession. But in the New Testament, there are dozens of little reports that are, in a sense, extra biblical. You go, well, how so? They're in the New Testament. Yes, but they circulated orally before there was a single New Testament book. So let's call them, let's say, pre-New Testament. And many of them go back to the 30s AD. But hang on to that one. I'll, uh, I'll walk you through that one. But there's many of these. And Paul's introductory words tell you that this is one of them. Now, there's a lot of ways to tell. For one, like I said, a couple times in Paul's writings, here in 1 Corinthians, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I gave you that which I also received. The Aramaic equivalent, Paul's home language, Jesus' home language, the Aramaic, the Aramaic equivalent is, it's, technical, it's a technical phrase for giving and passing on tradition. The ones that were famous for this were the Pharisees, having scholars training them and passing on tradition, and they passed, them on, they passed it on. Paul, he tells us, was a Pharisee. So he's part of this group that gives and passes on tradition, but we'd all assume that's what teachers do anyway. In part, they talk about sources and people. Okay, so back to verse 3. I gave you that which I was given as of first importance. I gave you what I was given. Okay. When does Paul write this? About 55 AD, give or take. But he says, this is when I came to Corinth. First two verses. This is what I preached to you when I came to Corinth. When did he come to Corinth? This is the date that's very firmly established by an archaeological find in the New Testament. And he came either at the end of 51 AD or the beginning of 52. They can narrow it down to a one-year calendar trip. So he says, he's writing it here. This is what I gave you when I was here with you in Corinth. Okay. So when and from whom did Paul receive this material? Right? You want to know that he got this from somebody who's in the, you know, right place, right time, somebody who's authoritative, somebody who can tell the truth, somebody who's hopefully a scholar themselves. All right, so he's preaching this at Corinth, 51 to 52 AD. First I'll give you the conclusion, and then I'll give you the argument for it. Most critics believe that Paul received this material about 35 AD, when he visited Jerusalem for 15 days and had a talk with Peter and James. James, the brother of Jesus now. The other James, son of Zebedee, John's brother, is dead. He's martyred. So Paul comes to Jerusalem about 35 AD. Well, this is very, very early. You know, when you're doing historiography, two really important things, whenever possible in the ancient world, and these are rare, are to have early eyewitness sources, which you almost don't have for any of Tiberius, 
and what you don't have for any of Alexander. Early eyewitness sources, and this dates about plus five. You go, well, how in the world are you going to argue that? Okay, that's the second text that I want to go to. Galatians, end of Galatians 1, beginning of Galatians 2. Again, Paul's the author, not disputed. And Paul says, he says, I was a persecutor of the church. I wasn't a good guy. And then God got a hold of me and showed me Jesus, revealed Jesus to me, he said. And then he said in Galatians 1.17 and 1.18, he said, I didn't go running up to Jerusalem to talk to those who were apostles before me. I went off by myself in Arabia for three years. And then I went up to Jerusalem. This is very important. I went off to Arabia for three years, and then I went up to Jerusalem. And remember, what's Paul considered authoritative? What's authoritative mean? Good scholar, right time, right place. He could be wrong, according to the skeptics. He could be wrong, but he's an honest source who's in the right place, right time to know what's going on. So let's use Paul for our math. 30 AD. When is the famous trip to Damascus where Paul says he met the risen Jesus? Some scholars put it at plus one, some at plus two, some at plus three, an average plus two. Okay. 30 AD, cross. Paul meets Jesus, plus two. He says, I went up, I went to Arabia for three years, and then I went up to Jerusalem. Two plus three, five. You go, well, I think he was converted at plus three. Great. Three plus three, six. Oh, I think he was converted plus one. Great. One plus three, four. But we know the range right here. And it's about, again, it doesn't make a difference if you're skeptic, conservative, same dates. About plus two for his conversion. Plus three for his trip to Jerusalem. We're at five. We're at plus five. Paul said, I went up to Jerusalem and I spent 15 days with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Cambridge New Testament professor, last generation, C.H. Dodd, made a very famous statement. He said, Paul spent 15 days with Peter and James, and it's safe to say they did more than talk about the weather. <laughs> well, what do you think they talked about at plus five, approximately plus five? Well, where is this told? Galatians 1. What's the theme of the book of Galatians? The gospel. What's the gospel again? Deity, death, resurrection of Jesus, and those who trust are those who are Christians. It's the theme of the book. Besides, if I'm Paul, who says he's preached nothing but Christ and him crucified, then he says if he's not raised from the dead, crucifixion means nothing. Can you imagine Paul going for 15 days, just a human argument, could you imagine him going for 15 days and not saying... Hey, Peter, James, you tell me how you saw him, and I'll tell you how I saw him. Got to come up. It'd be my first question. But again, the theme of Galatians is the gospel. And in that context, Paul says, I spent 15 days with them, chatting with them. Now, there's a Greek word in Galatians 1.18, very interesting term, hysteresi. Hysteresi. The root word is histor. H-I-S-T-O-R. It's the Greek word from which we get our English word, history. Now, you can't jump the gun and say, oh, well, that word means Paul was playing the role of the historian. Well, that would be to put 20th century meaning into 1st century. And what we really need to do is find out how this word is used in extra-biblical papyri and the other earliest writings. There's two word studies that I know of, two extended word studies in this word, neither written by a conservative, and both of them concluded that the best way to define hysteresi in this context is in the sense of playing a, an investigative reporter. That hysteresi means, basically it means this, I checked it out, I was there. You know, we, every night, 11 o'clock, your part of the country might be 10 o'clock, eyewitness news. We were there. We were there for you. Geraldo Rivera, you know, we're on, we're on the scene. We're in the middle of the hurricane down in Florida. You can't see it, but you can watch our reporter. 
That's the conclusion that these two studies came to, that hysteresi means to check something out firsthand, to play the role of investigative reporter. So, Paul says, Jesus died. I met him. I went to Jerusalem. I met Peter, the chief apostle. I met James, the brother of Jesus. And in context, I think it's safe to argue, they discuss the gospel. Now, how does the gospel define? Back 1 Corinthians 15, it's at least the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is certainly part of the definition, as you see on your brochures and so on, and in the article that was in the paper, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20, that if Christ has not been raised twice, he says our faith is vain. Once, verse 18, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your loved ones who died in Christ don't have any Christian hope. Maybe the most pessimistic verse in the Bible, verse 19, he says, if Christ hasn't been raised, we are of all persons most miserable. And then in verse 20, he says, but Jesus is raised from the dead, so just reverse everything I see. I mean, it, what I'm saying is it's that important. And he's talking to James and Peter, right about here, playing the role of an investigator. By the way, an ancient piece of papyri uses histor, hysteresi, this way. It's used of a geographer who's checking out a river. Instead of asking people, what's up around that bed and what's up there, he goes himself. This is where I had to portage. This is fast-moving water. This is shallow. Had to get out and push. That was the use of hysteresi, of being there, checking it, and giving you a report. That's one use of it. In, papyri, in the ancient papyri, which is a very select period of time, shortly after, it only goes a little bit longer, um, about 100 years, that, that the papyri after this. So, so Paul's here in doing this. All right. Now, then, as I told you, there's no chapter division there. James 1 goes right into James 2. This is one passage in the originals. And in James chapter 2, verse 2, I think it's one of the oddest, strangest, most interesting verses in the entire New Testament. Galatians 2.2, 2, Paul says this. Fourteen years later, I went back up to Jerusalem. Critics like Helmut Kester put this at 48 AD, still very early. 48 AD. He says, 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem again, Galatians 2.2, 2, to set before the apostles the gospel message I was preaching to see if I was running or had run in vain. What? Oh, well, yeah. I went up there again to set before them the gospel message I was preaching to make sure we were on the same page. <laughs> Paul, you waited 18 years to check it out? And Paul would say, you're not following my argument very well, are you? Let's do it again. The gospel originates here, or even before when Jesus is preaching. I met him here, so I got it from Jesus himself. Can you beat that source? I didn't think so. All right. I got it from Peter and James. Can you beat those guys? Didn't think so. This is at least my third attempt to verify it, but my other two were much closer. No, this isn't my first attempt to verify it. Been up there before. Checked it out. Now, in Galatians 1, the ones who are present are Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, Paul. In, in Galatians 2, now you got Barnabas, you got Titus, you know, people who, if they were alive in our day and time, would command quite a crowd, you know. Titus or Barnabas, but they were small fry in this discussion because Peter was there again, Galatians 2, James, the brother of Jesus, there again, Paul, there again, and one fourth member, John, the son of Zebedee. I, don't, I doubt anybody could make much of a case that these aren't the four most influential names in the early church. Peter had apostle, James, the brother of Jesus. Paul, the persecutor turned believer, and John, often called the beloved disciple, 
They're all there. Paul, what's he doing? He set before them the gospel he was preaching. And Galatians chapter 2, just a few verses later, these five words. They added nothing to me. Really? Yeah. I went up there and saw the big guys. He calls them pillars, the pillars of the church. Paul went to see Peter, James, John, and they added nothing to me. What does that mean? Well, I think Paul's saying it means we're all on the same page. It means we're all preaching the same gospel. In fact, Paul says something just like that after the early Christian creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7, which is, I would say is more respected by critics than any other New Testament passage. Just a few verses later, 1 Corinthians 15, 11, four verses later, Paul says this about the apostles. You just got done talking about the apostles, just got done talking about them seeing Jesus. And he said, 1 Corinthians 15, 11, whether it is I or they, so we teach and so you believe. And the next few verses, he uses the plural pronoun, I think it's three times. Now, who's the we, we, we? That's he and the other apostles. But again, verse 11, whether you heard from me or whether you heard from them, he says, whether it is I or whether it is they, so we preach and so you believe. So we get it, first, we get it from them, Galatians 2, they added nothing to me, through Paul's eyes there. And then we get it from Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 11, we're all preaching the same message. It's a very early date, plus we've got the backup from here and here. You know, I don't need to tell you that that's not a day of instant messaging. It's not a day of emails. These folks in Jerusalem may not have heard that Paul was coming until just shortly before he came. You know, I, I appreciate, here's Peter the fisherman, John the fisherman, James, the brother of Jesus, what was he, carpenter? It's a good guess. They're there, and Peter looks up and says, oh, no, here comes Paul. This guy is obsessive compulsive. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he says, this guy just rakes me over the coals every time he comes. I mean, he just asks questions from every which way from whatever. He goes, Whew. It's tough. James, you're the pastor of this church. You talk to him. <laughs> no, I'm just a carpenter. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Nobody argues with John. John, you go talk to him. And by that time, Paul walks through the front door. Hey, guys. Good to see you. I'm just saying Paul was a very high-powered source. But, five words, they added nothing to me. So what happens? They said, Paul, you go out to the Gentiles and take this message. Peter's going to go to the Jews. Message is the same. Now, I won't get into discussions about whether the earliest Jewish Christians still obeyed um, you know, part of the law and things like that. It's another issue. But on the nature of the gospel, deity, death, the resurrection, they look like they're all on the same page. All right, just a few more moves here. This all happens, the earliest date, not Jesus, but the earliest date with the men, about 35 AD. But this is when Paul, Paul knew his testimony. This is when Paul heard their testimony. You can't say this report is plus five. This is when Paul heard their report. Can we get any further back than plus five? I mean, not that that's... You have, to, you have to study ancient historiography to know what this is like in the ancient world. In fact, by the way, two critical sources, not evangelical, non-conservative, two sources, a German historian, Hans von Kampenhausen, says this text, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, says gives you everything you could possibly ask for from an ancient historical text. And then an American critic, first time I met this guy, he was representing the agnostic viewpoint at a series of debates, Howard Clark Key. He wrote a little book called What Can We Know About Jesus, published by Cambridge University Press. And he starts his book like this. 
He says, the earliest material that we have for Jesus, including 1 Corinthians 9.1, I'm I not an apostle, have I not seen the Lord? And 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7. Key says, and you have to know how rare this is in contemporary research, but Key, who was representing the agnostic viewpoint, Key says, this material is so tight, so early, so historical, you could take it into a court of law and get a positive verdict. I'm just saying the kind of respect that a person who represents an agnostic viewpoint in a, in a debate years ago, I met him at the same debate where I met a series of debates in Dallas, Texas, where I met Anthony Flew. And he said you could take it to court of law. That's how much this is respected. But this is when Paul got it. Now, Paul knew his testimony, but this is when he heard theirs. Okay, now watch carefully. If Peter and James gave it to him, then they had it before he had it. Now, a creedal statement, as I'll try to explain tomorrow, a creedal statement is an oral statement. We now know that up to 90% of Jesus' audiences were illiterate, contrary to other things you've heard. Large percentage, 70, 90% illiterate. How do you teach an illiterate audience? You largely repeat and repeat so it can be passed on by memory, and Jews were very, very good at that, far better than we are today, because they memorized large passages of scripture. They did that in synagogue. So number one, you either repeat, 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 those are the creeds and the traditions and so on that I've been defining, or you tell stories, ah, parables. So you tell stories, or you give short, pithy statements. It takes a while for these creedal statements to be, to be published in short, pithy. When you read them in the Greek, some of your translations have it set off like this. In the translations, it's set off in verse. Now, it takes a while to get things in that form. Okay. So when Paul hears it, they had it before Paul, Peter and James. It takes a while to get it into that form, and we're already back to the cross. So much so, let me give you the names of three scholars who argue that this material, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7, goes all the way back to 30 AD. All right, these are all, one of them's an American, but all three of them teach or just retired from British universities. Larry Hurtado, he's the American, uh, I think he's head of the religion department at Edinburgh University. Hurtado specializes on the deity of Christ. He asks the question, when and for what reasons was Jesus recognized as deity? And he's written some huge works. His big one is called Lord Jesus Christ, about 500 pages, published a few years ago. It's the most scholarly treatise written on the subject. Second, Richard Baucom, retired from St. Andrews University in Scotland, he may be retired even from Cambridge now, but he, we left St. Andrews, he retired in Cambridge, and last time I heard he was distinguished professor at Cambridge University, Richard Baucom. And the third person is as well known as any historical Jesus scholar, James D.G. Dunn, who recently retired from Durham University. And here's what they say together. They say, coming out of the gate, 30 AD, two doctrines had to have been preached from the beginning or there'd be no Christianity today. Two doctrines had to be teach, taught from the beginning. The deity of Christ, he's the son of God, and Hurtado argues this from early hymns, from, from writings on pottery, from some really early inscriptions from the 30s AD. He says you have to have the deity of Christ, he's perceived to be the son of God, and the resurrection. So Hurtado says, right here. Baucom says, right here. And James D.G. Dunn, who may be the most influential of the, of the three, Dunn says, this material Paul's given us in 1 Corinthians 15, which he gave orally here, which he received here, and by the way, Baucom says, this is a consensus New Testament position. Critics, conservatives, everybody left, right. He's that Paul got this material at 35 A.D. Baucom says that's consensus. Dunn says this material had to have been creedalized 
You ready? Within six months after the event, he said, this happened, whatever year you make it, 3033, this happened in the spring. By fall, this material was creedalized and diverse. So these fellows, Hurtado, Bauckham, Dunn, say that coming out of the gate, we've got deity and resurrection. And so when Bauckham says, consensus, 35 AD, Again, this is an example of how a critical scholar, it, the point I was trying to make at the beginning, there's none of these specialists who say, ah, oh, you're using the New Testament. That's not allowed. They use the New Testament. Everybody uses the New Testament. They just don't use it the way evangelical lay people do. That would take a whole other lecture, but they go after it with a whole different hermeneutic. But they do think it's the best text out there. If you said to them, well, Josephus talks about this, they'd say, forget Josephus. Paul's way better. That is exactly what they'd say. Yeah, but Josephus is secular. Forget it. Paul's way better. That's what they'd say. In fact, once I was giving this lecture just a few years ago. I was giving it in Cambridge. And I had two hours to speak. And part of my lecture was to do this timeline. There were only about 35 people there. They were all professors and PhD students. And imagine as I'm doing this and, you know, stepping off my timeline, I see somebody walk into the back, and I know who he is, and I'm thinking, oh, for crying out loud, Richard Baucom's here. Everybody in the room, you know, they're looking back going, ooh, Richard Baucom's here. Everybody wants to talk to Richard Baucom of Cambridge Research, Distinguished Researcher, Senior Researcher at Cambridge. Lecture was over. I gave the whole thing. Students were flocking back around Balkan. A few came up and asked questions. Room cleared out. Richard was there alone. I walked up to him and I said, Richard, good to see you again. I've got a question for you. You've heard my whole spiel for two hours. You've seen my timeline. Here's what I want to ask you. What would you correct? He stood there for many went, I think it's pretty good. I just leave it. And I said, come on, Richard. You're being kind. I really, really want to know. I want to learn. Where, what did I say wrong? What doesn't represent contemporary scholarship? What could I correct? And he said, all right, I'll tell you one thing. If I were you and you were talking about the creeds and you were given a little bit of a bibliography, I would have cited Oscar Coleman's book, The Earliest Christian Confessions. He was giving me a bibliographic note. You left out the main book on the subject. And I kind of laughed a little bit, and I said, I'm not laughing at you. I said, I gave the same lecture to Oxford three days ago, and I spent five minutes on that book. I said, you're totally right. Coleman's the best book in the field. What else can I add? He said, that's it. I quite agree with everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is, this is not the state of New Testament scholarship 40 years ago. In fact, when I studied at Michigan State in the mid-70s, except for evangelicals, you might be able to find five scholars who believed in the empty tomb. And you know, the empty tomb's not a supernatural event. Things happen to make tombs empty, and they don't have to be supernatural. But I could probably count, while I was doing my dissertation, maybe five non-evangelical scholars who believed in the empty tomb. Today? As nearly as I can tell, between two-thirds and three-quarters of relevant scholars who, get in, who dig in here and do research, historians, philosophers, uh, theologians, New Testament writers, concede the empty tomb. Dale Allison, the skeptic with whom I began, who said, I don't doubt that Jesus' earliest followers saw him again after his death. He says he just barely concedes it. He says by a short margin, but he said, I'll concede the empty tomb. Skeptic. Here's another one. E.P. Sanders, called Ed by his friends. E.P. Sanders used to teach at Oxford, retired just a few years ago from Duke. He says in his little book, The Human Figure of Jesus, where he starts out the same way I am by talking about historical facts that believers and unbelievers share, 
He says several times in the book, he doesn't explain it, but he says this. He said it's a given among New Testament scholars today, critics and not, it's a given that after Jesus' death, his disciples saw him again. He said, how he appeared? I'm not prepared to answer that. But, I, but the disciples saw, now realize what he's doing. He's, just not, he's not giving his view. He's giving you consensus scholarship. Scholarship has moved over so much that he says it's an equally secure fact to believe that Jesus' earliest followers not thought they saw him. That's usually why I say it. Sanders said that they saw him. I don't go that, I mean, I don't, I don't go that far. I usually say contemporary scholarship says the earliest disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. Here's Bart Ehrman. He says, that comment, the one I just made, Jesus' earliest followers had experiences that they believe were appearances of the risen Jesus. Bart Ehrman says, I have no objection to that. The, the well-known skeptic, um, University of North Carolina, if you're not familiar with him, he's the hot skeptic today in the US. He says, I have no problem with that statement. He says, why should I have a problem with it? It's established by recognized historiography. He says, you can get there by historical principles. Kind of reminds you of, of um, uh, Key's comment, Howard Clark Key, saying we could take it to a court of law. He says, of course I would concede it. But then here's what Bart Ehrman's going to say. Well, of course you have people, you have things we can call appearances. That's clear. But then what do skeptics do? They're going to come up with what we call a naturalistic alternative theory. Now let me define, I just have a few minutes here. Let me define a naturalistic alternative theory. This is not a naturalistic alternative theory. You're a loser. It didn't happen. No. What's that? That's not a naturalistic theory, that's just a denial. That counts no more than a believer saying, yeah, you got it, it happened. Okay, they're both rather vehement affirmations or denials. Those are not naturalistic theories. Here's a naturalistic theory. Jesus really didn't rise from the dead. What happened was, fill in the blank. You gotta fill in the blank. I did a survey of naturalistic scholars, I mean, scholars who take naturalistic theories, and going across the whole board, specialists and non-specialists. In other words, I went to some of the internet type websites with people who don't have cr the credentials that some of the, the most of these guys do, but I counted them too. In fact, they're by far the largest margin of what the figure I'm gonna give you here. About 25% of scholars writing today they, they can fill in that blank. I'll tell you what happened. And the vast majority of that 25% are people who, if you look at their credentials, they have a BA, no more. They don't work in this field. I'm dead serious. They could be, I, mean, I could give you some examples. But I mean, by way of their job, they work at, um, their salesman with a BA in history. I'll count them, trying to be honest here. They, they don't rank with the skeptics with the degrees who are the specialists, but I'll count them. But what I'm saying is, they're the vast majority of the 25%. If you ask the guys with the PhDs who stay, teach in the big universities around the world, how many of you think you could fill in the blank? I haven't counted that. I don't know, but I would imagine it's probably around 10%. Very, very low. And here's what happens. The problem with trying to fill in the blank is that when you do it, you get kind of forced back against the wall by the data I just mentioned. And somebody will say, well, using only that data, how would you answer this, 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 and this? And they'll come up with three, four, five, six, seven, eight refutations from just the data that skeptics and believers share. So most don't try to go there. Some think that the most popular response today, now I, I doubt this, but some think that the most popular response today is the guy who just says, you know something? I don't know what happened, but I really don't believe it. That's not a naturalistic theory. That's again, a sort of a 
quasi-denial, sort of denial, but they don't fill in the blank. Very few skeptics today use those old naturalistic theories. The disciples stole the body, you know, or combination theories. Jesus came from Venus. <laughs> he was a very wise man, you know, but so was Superman. He had strange, po strange powers, like the 1958 black and white television special, he could change rivers and bend steel with his bare hands. Well, see, Jesus visited from Krypton, and he, I mean, you hear, I heard a lecturer doing that one time on a campus. I stood off kind of in the back and listened to this. It's a very interesting argument because there are some other presuppositions. They said Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes because that's all the people from this planet have. They go, well, you've got an Aryan Jesus. That's not the kind of Jesus we have from history. Jesus was Middle Eastern. You have to account for that. I'm just, the point I'm making is people can say anything. They can fill in the blank with anything. But very few scholars do it because the data go against them. All right. According to my watch, I've only got about three minutes. Let me tell you real briefly. Maybe some of you here know my story about my own family because I, just, I was just counting recently and our story is told in at least 11 million pieces of literature by other people. In 1995, my wife died of stomach cancer. Um, I had these make-believe, okay? I wanna make sure everybody hears me. This didn't happen. But I had make, these make-believe discussions with God on my front porch, I mean, I could imagine. Because my wife was up to her sleeping. She's sleeping 16, 17 hours a day. She came home with a tube in her stomach. Had to feed her, give her medicine, and she would sleep most of the day. I had a child monitor up there. First week of May, I went on the front porch, and I pictured myself, I mean, I sat on the front porch, but I pictured myself asking God, which I did many times, why? She's 43 years old. My young, youngest child is only nine. What's going on? And I pictured, in my mind, I pictured God saying, Gary, I know it's rough. Let me ask you a question. What kind of a world is this? Well, if you're one of my students, you know that no matter what question you ask me, I'll get back to the resurrection sooner or later. It's my favorite topic. I've done 18 of my 35 books on the resurrection. There's no other answer. So I thought, ah, what kind of a world is it? Lord, I don't know. It's a world where you raised your son from the dead. Okay, good. <laughs> but Lord, what I want to know is why is she, Gary, You know, my son crawled, called to me from the cross. He thought I'd forsaken him. Yeah, I know. You know something? I answered his prayer. What? I answered his prayer. What do you mean you answered his prayer? I raised him from the dead on Sunday. <laughs> Lord, he was suffering on the cross and... Oh, no. Are you telling me she's going to die? And I'll only get the answer if I go through it? Gary, I'm just telling you, my son was on the cross. I left him there. Should you get a better deal than he gets? Oh, couldn't answer that. And then I pictured his final answer to me to be something like, look, relax. You guys will be together some days. A card that somebody gave me when I put the cards away in the attic, this card is up on top. It's the card that was the most moving. For years, I couldn't repeat the sentence on the card. I still struggle uh, with it sometimes 15 years later. But the card said, I'll bet you can't wait for that day when you get to heaven and you get to walk with your wife hand in hand. I said, Lord, I can't take this. We were best friends, the mother of my four children. I said, Lord, I can't, I can't wait that many years. The worst, I told my closest friends, the worst possible thing has come upon me. But still, God's good. I believe that. I don't have to figure it out to say God's good. But I'm suggesting that this gets us right back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 18. Paul said, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, our loved ones who died in Christ have died in vain. I don't believe my wife died in vain. I think there's very good evidence for what's going on there. Not just the resurrection, it's a whole other topic, but not just the resurrection. I think there's no way she died in vain.
But what I'm saying is if you have the resurrection, the, the straight line resurrection argument is to eternal life. That's what the resurrection is. It's to eternal life. The message of the New Testament is because of the resurrection of Jesus, eternal life is available. And in this make-believe story about what God would say to me, I pictured him saying, you know, it's all going to work out. You guys are going to be together. It's hard now, but you'll see. And you know today, I still don't know my, why my wife died at age 43. I don't know. But I'll tell you something honestly with all my heart. It's irrelevant. Okay, what good would it do to know why she died? Would that help me? I mean, you know, it might give me a little, might answer a couple questions, but, you know, where are my kids? What are they going to do? And what about her? How, how is she doing? I'm just saying, folks, Paul says it this way, and I'll end with this. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, another one of those six to eight books that critics accept, Paul says, he said, we mourn. Remember, Jesus wept at Lazarus' grave. Paul said, we mourn, but not as those without hope. We mourn, but not as those without hope. My family mourned. I'm going to tell you something kind of gross, maybe, to some of you. The first time I saw my wife lay in the casket when we went to the funeral home, I thought I was going to die. But do you ever think about the difference between mourning with hope and mourning with all, without hope? You know the difference? It's only eternity. Mourning with hope, mourning without hope. Do I know all the answers? Absolutely not. I know where she died. I don't. But it's not a cop-out. It really isn't, unless this argument can be disproven. It's not a cop-out to say, I don't know the answer, but I know the one who knows the answer, because this argument tells me he went through it to secure that. In fact, almost 20 times in the New Testament, we're told that believers will be raised like Jesus because of the resurrection. That's just one of many, many impra practical points. You know, kind of a where do we go from here. So I'll leave you with that. I think uh, we're going to have some directions here about questions. And we'll come back. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, Paul being a Jewish, Jewish man and uh, Christ being crucified as the Passover lamb, would have he had not been in uh, Jerusalem on the day of the crucifixion? Would who not have been? Paul? Paul. With probably Gamaliel? Because he studied under Gamaliel, yeah. I mean? Yeah, the prominent Jewish teacher. Um, he could have been. But here's the problem. I'm trying to be really, really careful and not going any further than my data lead and where critics go, and here's what they're going to say. He could have been there. Time and place, where else would you be if somebody's being crucified out there claiming to be this king of the Jews? What are you doing? You're probably looking in. The only problem is we don't know that for sure. So could he have been? Absolutely. Do we know any more? We don't. Thanks. That, that was just a... Uh something that I thought of as I read the scriptures. He's a Jewish man. He probably seen it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I just don't have any source that tells me that. Yes, sir. Um, if the purpose of the resurrection was to allow people to go to heaven afterwards, why doesn't it just one cover? Of, one of many purposes, but anyway, go oh, Okay, thank you. Um, why doesn't it just cover everyone? Why doesn't what? The resurrection just could take care of everyone. Well, why do you have to say some statement or something like that to get in? Why do you say it's? You're asking me, you said, why do you say it's what? Why, why does someone have to, like, meet some requirements or something for the oh, resurrection? Like, sort of like, why are only Christians invited? Yeah, basically. Okay, all I can do is take the text. It's, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not my, I, I can't come along and say, well, you know what? Paul says this, Jesus said this. I would really like to get everybody there. That'd be neat. I mean, it really, really would. But all I can do is exegete a passage. All I can do is tell you what they're saying, and that's their conclusion. So if scholars want to come along and say, well, I think the way is a little broader, or I'll tell you a view that I have some affinity with, and I'll make people mad both ways, but, <laughs> but like what about those who never heard the gospel, for example? Okay, there's a, there's a bit in me that says, um, uh, God's willing to reveal himself, and those who believe based on what they've seen around them, if they respond properly, now I don't ever think salvation is by works. I think that's very, very clear. But possibly God does a work of grace in their heart if they respond to the light they have. So that, I mean, I'm really open to that. In fact, if you get the copy of the book, 
what about those who've never heard four views? Four views on those who've never heard? Um, that's a real prominent evangelical response. And I'm thinking, you know, you might be able to do this. But my point is, scholars take this and go, well, maybe, yeah. But all I'm saying is if you exegete Paul and Paul's words, Jesus and his words, I'm basically repeating their message. I don't feel free to, you know, if I do, I'm going to say what I just said. I'm going to say, I have an inkling. I kind of feel like, yeah, maybe I can make that move. But I can't claim, well, you know what? There is a place in Romans where you can make that argument. But I think you have to be real clear who's possibly saying what. I don't want to represent, just, just like I did with the question about Paul. Could he have been at the cross? Yeah. Any reason to think that? No. I mean, not that I know of. I'd say the same thing. I'd be willing, and if you go, okay, let your hair down a little bit, what little I have. Um, <laughs> What do you think happened? Well, I'm willing to speculate like I just did a moment ago, but not if I'm trying to tell you what Paul or James, I mean, uh, Paul or Jesus said. Okay. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Yes. Hey, this is kind of off subject, so I hope you don't mind. And if yeah, I don't know what he was talking about when he said ask him anything you want to. I'll, okay. Well, I'll tell you flat out <laughs> if I can't answer it, okay? Okay, well, this goes to you and also to the professors. I know a lot of you said you were in the scientific field, but I feel like a lot of argument that I get from my friends and people that I talk to for not believing in Jesus is not believing in creation, believing from an evolutionistic standpoint. And the two arguments that I hear the most are carbon dating, saying the world is billions and billions of years old, it, as well as billions and billions. That's usually okay. the term I get. All right. um, forgive me if you'd say something else. No, no, no. I, then, I, just, <laughs> I just didn't hear what you said. Yeah. And then the other one was the argument for the speed of light and stars that we know are far, far away. So and was it uniform and all mm -hmm, that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had anything about that or if you professors had anything to okay, say. But let, let me answer your first question. Are you saying if the issue, here's how I heard you, if the issue is about the gospel and what you've done with Jesus, why is all the arguing to do with periphery, what you think are periphery issues such as creation, evolution, the speed of light and so on? Well, yeah, kind of more Jesus is deity. We see that. You've just proven that in this gospel study. And a lot of people argue that there is no God, that all of, create, all of life is just a chance. It came by evolution. And that puts no purpose in life. And the Bible, which is what you've used to prove Jesus is deity, his death is resurrection, also says God created the earth in uh, seven days. And it's, the earth is relatively young from a biblical standpoint, if you take it point in case. Some say that, some don't. Mm, okay. Bible scholars, I mean. Okay. Some say that, some don't. Okay. So my question is, would you have anything to say about uh, arguments for just those two things? I think I would say carbon dating and the, the speed of light from No, stars. because I'm not a scientist. Now, maybe this whole road on here will, but I will make one comment. <laughs> I teach my students regularly we should major on the major and minor on the minor. If, and so with that, if you said to me, okay, great, what's the major here? I'd say it's the nature of the gospel, this. It was the, it was the central proclamation of the New Testament. Evangelicals get their name from the Greek word evangelion, the good news. It's a central proclamation. Personally, personally, I think there's a lot of range for potential views on creation. I think there's a lot of range. And although they're important questions, they are not to be compared, in my mind, with the importance of this. Now, just that comment about where we're putting the emphasis, so that I'm not saying something like this to you, okay? This is not what I'm saying. You all hear me? This is not what I'm saying. I'm not going to say, well, according to Paul and Jesus, trust Christ and his message. Oh, and by the way, you, take, you say you take what view on creation? Well, if you don't take another view, you're going to hell. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not elevating one of those views and putting it up here. So now the gospel is deity, death, resurrection, and what view do you take again? You know, that's not the gospel. So I'd say there's room for the dialogue here. We should debate. And having said that, I'll chicken out because it's not my area. And do you folks want to make? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll take the mic here real quick. If I recall, this is a professor of physics, right? Yes, professor of physics. Um, more than happy to stick around and talk about this issue. Uh, you're absolutely right. The age of the earth uh, and questions about creation are not a salvation issue. Not a salvation issue. So there are ranges within Christianity. Um, having studied the issue myself, so now I'm giving you an opinion, uh, I do believe that 
Uh, the scientific evidence that the Earth is 4.58 billion years old is very strong. The scientific evidence that the universe is about, oh, it changes a little bit, but about 15 billion years plus or minus two is very strong, it's overwhelming. So then the question is, what do the scriptures say about that? And uh, having studied Genesis 1 extensively, and other passages, it's not just Genesis 1, um, I believe it doesn't actually say. <laughs> and I looked really hard. <laughs> so anyway, totally happy to tell anybody all the details on that. But essentially, the, the scriptural question is, does it make a statement about how old the earth is? And it, it doesn't. All right, so ask me later if you want. And I'm going to get in line because I have my own question. Oh, that's good. That's good. So what you're saying is scientifically you think you have the answer, but biblically you're an agnostic on this that one. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> yes. Um, I just had a question about your specific wording. Um, okay. You kind of made the statement to make it sound like a lot of the um, professors that you talk to would agree that the apostles saw Christ after his death. Correct. That several major writers that teach at Oxford and other schools say that that's a consensus view among scholars. Yes. yes. Okay. But I said I say it a little bit differently. I say they have experiences that they believe were appearances of the risen Jesus. I think that's a little more nuanced. But yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. In the consensus, are they saying they have seen him alive? Yes. Okay. Yeah, like Ed Sanders says. One of the specific. Again, the guy at Duke and before that at Oxford says, um, he said, a fact that is as solid as any New Testament fact is that the earliest followers of Jesus saw Jesus again after his death. In what sense they saw, you know, how he appeared, mm -hmm. he said, I'm not equipped to answer that right now. Oh. But that he appeared after his death, yes, after his death. Gotcha. Thank you You're very welcome. much. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my name is Joe. Uh, I just came here, my friend just called me, I didn't I wish I knew this before because I kind of missed the beginning. But um, first of all, I want to say I don't know anything pretty much about this. But my standpoint sure. is more of like a scientific method, kind of like see the data and the proof and everything. Sure. And you said before that people that say like I don't know, we want to find out, shouldn't be listened to. Or what were you? What was your, like your main? Like you said, people say like, oh, I don't know what happened. Like, what was your standpoint on that again? Oh, what I was saying, I was in that context. I was talking about naturalistic theories. How do you fill in the blank? The blank again was, Jesus isn't raised from the dead. What really happened was fill in the blank. That's a naturalistic response that tries to give up. And I said, don't just deny it. Don't just accept it. Tell me why you don't. So I was referring to a specific number of people, 25% or less, who try to fill in that blank. And if you take the real, the skeptical, non-specialist websites away, <laughs> it's about 10% is my guess. Overall, about 25%. I was describing a response to the resurrection. Okay, and um, I guess my follow-up question is, like I'm more of a, like I said, like a scientific method, like find sure. the data and the proof is, that my problem is with religion is that it can't change. And that what? It, it can't change, like it's basically that it just, like the book and that's pretty much it, and then science is something that could change over time and can be corrected. So what my problem is is that I can't, just accept something and say it's true when it's been proven wrong or kind of wrong, but with like the age of the earth. But science has been proven wrong too. But you yeah, know, I mean science. that's that's the point why I like science is because it can change according to new data. You know, I mean that's a, that's a thoughtful point. But just from the the exchange at that mic before this, where we talked about creation. Yeah. Notice how we've said. See, several publishers, Zondervan University, they publish what are called three, four, five views books, and they say. You know, what's creation like? Four views. Predestination or free will? Four views. What I mean is, Christians have the same sorts of discussions because you just don't have data, you have interpretation. In any subject, you have data plus interpretation, science included. You have data plus interpretation. I'm just saying, I don't know if that's what you're talking about with changing, but, but if yeah. science can self-correct, New Testament scholarship can self-correct too. What I mean is this give and take. Now, I'm not trying to say, please, I'm not trying to say New Testament research is a science. I work in the area of philosophy of history, one of my areas. I think history would be a social science. It's not a hard science. I got somebody upset today saying that. Um, <laughs> it's not a hard science. So I make those same distinctions you do. I'm not trying to say New Testament's just like science. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying New Testament scholarship can be self-correcting too. Okay. 
So it's based on, like, on interpretation. Of what oh, it's, it's, it, you're, yeah. you're right. There's a lot of interpretation. Here's another one. What if we find a new papyrus with Greek words, and we see different meanings for words, and now we have to go back and change a few things in our own interpretation? Yeah. Okay. That happens sometimes. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. My question follows up on this, actually. You mentioned the distinction between your data set, which would be the historical text, the archaeological finds, things like that, and your interpretation. And you right. described a change in the interpretation of the scholarship over the past 40 years. My yep. question is, what, what changed? What was the catalyst for that? Did something new come up in the data set that spurred this along? Yes. I would say the answer to my question that I ask, the evidence that changed a generation of scholarship, the field was totally different in the 1970s when I did my dissertation. It's totally changed just 35 years later. And the number one, in my opinion, the number one response that's changed scholarship is this early creedal move where science is, I mean, uh, New Testament had been saying it all the way back to 1890, 1900, but it was very generic, very bland. About the 1960s and 1970s, scholarship started See, it, it's very, very specialized. You have to know Greek. I don't. You have to know Greek so well. I mean, I minored in it, but I've forgotten my stuff a long time ago. People who are really, really good, they can tell when there's syntax changes in the text. They can tell. You know how you're writing a paper, your students write papers, and they can't get their sentence to agree with the quote. So they're talking singular and the quote's plural, and so they just stick it in there anyway and it doesn't quite fit the quote. That's how these creedal passages read in the New Testament. They're a little bit of jar. Um, they give evidence of an Aramaic original. Um, they use a bunch of words that this writer, even though we have, a, say, a big body of information about Paul, he never uses five of these words anywhere else. So they have a list of criteria for when they're getting to a creed. But the most interesting thing is they almost all agree where the creeds are. And it's that because they think the creeds are an answer to the question. This is, I didn't say this, but to me this is the most exciting thing about creeds. I didn't say it tonight. Usually I say, the creeds are the answer to the question. It's like Jeopardy. You know, that's the answer. The question is, of what did earliest preaching consist before there was a single New Testament book? Answer, the creeds. So the creeds, let me say it this way. The creeds are a window into the first 20 years of Christendom. So now seen that way, where on my chart, you can get them back to here, from 50 back to here, you can see how important they are because they report the earliest community's beliefs. It's not necessarily, it's not proof, but it's the earliest community's beliefs in a time when we had no other material to compare. Like if the earliest, if James is the first epistle, I'm just saying if, and it's 48, or if 1 Thessalonians is in 50, you still have that almost 20 year block, and the answer is the creeds. And so when they, by the way, the center of almost every creed, deity, death, resurrection of Jesus, what we call the gospel. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, so I guess um, I may be asking you to kind of argue against yourself maybe, but of all of the skeptics that believe in the empty tomb, that believe um, that the apostles did see Jesus after his, after right. his death, mm -hmm. um, what is what do they have left to argue their point? What does who have left to argue what the, point? The skeptics. What do they have left if they if they believe? Oh, if they don't want to believe, what are they going to say? Yeah. Against just the empty tomb or against the resurrection appearances? Oh, I mean, of all the scholars that you say believe in these things, yeah, that don't believe in Christianity. About, about one third reject the empty tomb. Okay. And from what I can tell, I did an article on this with, by the way, a, a liberal source, not conservative. I gave a head count of where scholarship is, and I said about 75% of scholars writing today seem to believe in the resurrection. Now, by scholars today, I mean specialists in theology, New Testament, history, philosophy in this area, no matter whether they're atheist, agnostic, skeptic, moderate, conservative, about 75%. Now, I may not be answering well, I guess what I'm asking is for those people that are atheists oh, oh, what? That's who, right. who don't believe uh, right. in Christianity, right. but they do concede those points, right. what argument do they have? They're going to be the ones that come up with the naturalistic theories. They're going to fill in the blank. Okay. What really happened was, and who knows what they're going to say, 
But if you're in a debate or if you're dialoguing, you kind of have to be ready for whatever they're going to bring up, just like they have to be ready for your data. That happens in a debate. But, but they're going to fill in that blank. If they want an out, they've got to fill in that blank. And then I'm going to ask them for credible information to prove what they put in that blank. That's going to be really, really hard because there's no alternative sources that give other responses within like way more than a century. Okay. And you know, you got to play the same game. I don't mean you, but I mean, skeptics have to play the same game Christians play. That is, if Christians have to believe, have to produce sources, so do the skeptics. They got to, they got to produce sources too. And they don't have any, not in this early period. Not for, you say, well, how do you know what they have? No, I'm just talking about what sources are there for the first 150 years. There's virtually nothing to grab onto is any alternative view. And that includes the critics of Christianity who are writing. We have some of those too. So those, those who don't believe, I mean, those who do believe in those points of the empty tomb and stuff, they really have no conclusive data to support their points. Yeah, I, I'd say they have one of two moves. They can take an agnostic move, which, I mean, you know, it's not too thrilling to anybody. They can say, you know, I really don't know what happened. I just don't feel like believing. Mm. You go, well, that's your right. That's your right. But if you don't have data, I mean, what am I responding to? You know, the other crowd tries to fill in the blank. And then we're talking about data. Well, can you, can you give me one example of what they might say? Yeah, like the disciples stole the body, the example I gave. Okay. Now, now just take that view. The disciples stole the body. Virtually no scholar has taken that view since a guy named, now there's an exception. There's one recent, two recent who have. But there are virtually no scholars who've taken that view since a guy named Herman Samuel Reimarus, a German rationalist, about 1865. Sorry, 1765. Now, I, you know, just because you can name the guys on one hand in 250 years, I don't know, but I probably, that's probably a sign that it's not really good. I mean, there's not really good data. I'm just saying, if that's all you knew, is that nobody held it. But that, that's an example, Cyprus stole the body. And I'll tell you this, for those of you who, um, you know, you're Christians, and you wonder about these naturalistic theories, there are five of them reported in the New Testament. Three of them were thought up by Christians. That shows you that Christians could also be skeptical. That shows you Christians could also raise questions. You know, you got Downing Thomases all over who say, I gotta say this, I gotta see this before I believe. But the five main naturalistic theories, all five of them, well, one's hinted at. The other four are all supposed in the New Testament, as I said, three out of five by believers. I'm just saying, people think believers can't be very objective or can't ask tough questions. But I'll tell you what, in my experience, the believer had some of the best. And the reason they do is because they've taken a lot more time to study the data, so they see where the chinks are, and they go for that. Whereas somebody who hasn't studied it takes a shot from the hip, and it's like, well, that wasn't hard, like that. So sometimes the guys on the inside know where, the, where to hit. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. Yes, over here. If Jesus did raise from the dead, which I believe he did, then the question is, what are we going to do with him ourselves? Right. That is the question. Exactly. For and today, I, the question for, for today. For yeah. today is what are we for going to do with For 30 AD, it's this question. Yeah. <laughs> because what you do with him today depends on what he did back then. I mean, that's how I'm going to argue. Yeah. But that's why I did that little deal at the end with my wife, because I was trying to make the point. I've written a, a couple books on what differences it make. And you know, there's over 300 verses in the New Testament on the resurrection, over 300 verses. It's related to almost every area of theology and almost every area of practice. So it is the central event, but it's tied into all kinds of you know, ministry type topics or theological type topics. In 2 Peter 2, uh, chapter 3, Jesus, the Lord said that he, he doesn't wish that any would perish. It's right. not his will that any would perish. And in the Lord's Prayer, he says, let my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But if man has his own way and doesn't submit to God, then he will perish by his own will. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I take the point. That's my point I was raising earlier, the difference between giving my opinion and trying to say what the text says. Yes. Hi. First of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. So you, you, you make this, this 
case for this timeline and that you go all the way back to the very beginning with the creedal statements and build up from there right. uh, eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. Are there at the same time eyewitness accounts, creedal, probably not creedal, but written, whether Jewish or Roman or what have you, of that same time period that state the opposite fact? Did somebody go in, does somebody claim that they went into the tomb and saw the they body were after the resurrection. They were lying or they stole the did body. Did somebody say they were in the room when he was supposed to show up and he never did? Yeah, um, we don't have any of these accounts. Great question. We don't have a single source like that for 150 years with the exception of Matthew. I mean, the New Testament tells us that there were some folks who taught that Jesus' disciples came and stole the body while the Roman guards were sleeping. They taught that, but did they claim to have seen it? Nobody, there's no source that says, I saw contrary data. So the early Christians claim that God came, was born, died, was resurrected, and no contemporary contradicted no, that. If I understand what you're saying, no contemporary non-Christian source says, I was there, I saw it, I checked it out, I did research, and it's not what these guys are claiming. Thank no. you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, can I change time periods, like, a lot? Um, you want to talk about the Renaissance or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Abraham came from Canaan, right? Uh, and well, originally from east of that. Okay. Um, so last semester I saw a documentary on um, kind of like the origin of monotheism. Um, and like, I haven't really dug into this, I don't know a whole lot about it, but it was kind of, um, it came out of the polytheism of, and the henotheism of uh, Canaan and all of those, um, that area. And so I don't, I didn't really know, I don't know how to explain it. And um, they said like monotheism wasn't even firmly established until um, uh, Elijah. Until, um, that monotheism was established until Elijah? Until then, like it was just kind of like between henotheism and a monotheism. What about, I mean, if you just take the, Biblical material straightforward. What about Moses, or what about? Right. What I mean is, why are you why are you starting with Elijah? Um, this wait. isn't my area. I'm just asking okay. questions. That's what you do when it's not your area. You just ask questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm curious why you would start with Elijah. I don't. I just like um, when they brought everybody to the hill. Um, See, see, here's a response. If you look up religion books, they'll say Hinduism is the oldest religion on earth, and Hinduism starts, they'll say Hinduism started in prehistoric times, maybe 1500, maybe 2000. I'm thinking, what about the book of Genesis? If you, I mean, if you just take sources as sources, just to compare, you've got the source. Now, if you mean Judaism, if you mean Judaism going back to, say, Abraham, that's way before Elijah. But I mean, there are sources way before Abraham, out of which this tradition came. So I, I just have no idea why you'd start with Elijah. Yeah, I didn't know either. Um, <laughs> but, well, it was just like, um, it was just something I hadn't had time to dig into, and so it's. I've, yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, for, for a long time, decades, uh, some of the prevailing argument is that polytheism was the earliest form of religion. Just lately, that started to change. And if you email me, I can give you a source. First of all, a, a major German work, multi-volume work on this, and another work that downloads it for, America, for an English-speaking audience. I can send you sources if you want. But some of the data are just starting to change. David Hume, the skeptical philosopher, argued some things like this. So we're talking about the time of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he died, I think, 1776, Hume. So he did some of that, his dialogues on natural religion. But, but I, I think, way out of my area, but I think just in the last few decades, there have been some significant strides away from that view. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome, thank you. Yes, sir. Now that you've proven that um, Jesus was, in fact, raised from the dead, can okay. you show us how the resurrection indicates that Jesus is the Christ? Okay, so, okay, first of all, I don't think I've proven anything. That's a, okay, that's, well, you've presented evidence. That's a nuance, yeah. <laughs> I would never use that word. Um, because, because history is inductive, just like almost every discipline we have is. 
Okay, but are you asking me how would I give an argument from the resurrection to the deity of Christ? Uh, yes, how does the resurrection um, indicate that Jesus is who he claims to be? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, first of all, I use the same argument, this minimal facts. I'm going to use the verses that pretty much, I'm sorry, the text that pretty much as believers and unbelievers agree on. And so I'm not going to argue for the deity of Jesus the way most Christians argue for it. Now, if you ask the average Christian, in my opinion, when you ask them, they're going to say, oh, the best verses for the deity of Jesus, I mean, where Jesus answered. I'm not talking about John 1, 1, in the beginning of the word, word was with God. Jesus called God, depending on the Greek syntax, Jesus called God about six to nine times in the New Testament. But that's other people calling him that. Okay, if you use Jesus, Jesus never says, I am God. Okay, so now the question is, does he say something that would be in the ballpark? Does he make claims? And if you have to ask the average Christian, they, in my experience, they make this move. They'll say, well, John 10.30 says, I am the Father of one. John 8.58 says, before Abraham was, I am. You can't use that argument, any of those arguments with the critics because they don't like the Gospel of John. Now, you say, well, tough. But, I mean, the point is I'm using their data and their sources. So I've got I to work the way they work. They love Mark, and they love a source that they call Q. That's another whole subject. Um, if you ask me what's the strongest text in the New Testament where Jesus claims to be deity, I'd say it's Mark 14, 61 to 64, where Jesus answers the high priest, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And he responds, and this is Greek, and he's answering in Aramaic, but he responds in Greek, ego a me, I am. And henceforth you'll see the son of man coming on the clouds, in judgment it's implied, and the high priest, now, we'd respond differently today. Um, but the high priest makes a formal declaration of blasphemy, which is to rip his garment. And I think he's basically saying, gotcha. Because remember, he had other witnesses come in. He sent them all away. And I think he's got this feeling that they're going mano a mano. I really think so. He's I'm sick and tired of sending my guys out there, and you're blowing them away. I'm sick of it. You and I are going to settle this thing right here. I mean, I really think that's what's going on there. He says, just tell me up front, are you the Christ, okay, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, the Son of God? Jesus says, ego me. And then he says, henceforth you'll see the Son of Man. Now, a lot of people think Son of Man is a human title. You hear pastors say, Son of Man, Jesus is a man. Son of God, he's Son of God. The answer to that is, eh. <laughs> Son of Man, according to most New Testament scholars, is a title of deity. In fact, Contemporary Jewish sources use son of man of a person who shares God's throne, who is worshipped. I mean, these are pretty lofty terms for monotheistic Jewish population. And when Jesus called himself son of man, the high priest should have said, if he's only saying I'm a man, high priest should have said, no, 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 no. You're not getting away with that easily. I ask you if you're the son of God, and you're doing the son of man stuff. No, when Jesus said, I'm the son of man, he goes, <laughs> Okay, so there's a couple titles Jesus is claiming. He claims, are you the son, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Ego me, I am. Henceforth, you'll see the son of man. Okay, I'll give you a bunch of verses. But basically, I think both titles are Jesus making very special claims. I've got some other things I'd say. Um, Mark chapter 2, he claims to forgive sin. And they go, Whoa! You can't forgive sin. There's no man on earth who can forgive sin. Only God can. And Jesus said, well, so you know I can do it. I'll raise this guy. I mean, he was crippled. He wasn't dead. I'll raise him. Now, what's the point? To show that he had ability to forgive sins. Well, the, the guys that already said it, the scholars that already said it, no human can do this. Only God can do it. I think Jesus is basically saying, oh, we're in the same ballpark. Um... <laughs> There's other times like this. Okay, now here's why I'd use the resurrection. So we can establish, in my opinion, that Jesus made extraordinary claims about himself. Ego and me, I'm the son of man, many other passages. Okay, now what happens if he's dead and he's alive a few days later? He, unless you already believe he's God, he can't act on himself because he's dead. His claim is, the Father's going to raise me. And all of a sudden, he's 
alive and healed on Sunday, Saturday night, according to some, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Sunday, New Week starts Saturday night. Okay, now who would have to have been involved? Unless you already believe he's God, it's not Jesus, it's the Father. Now the, Holy, the, the New Testament says all three had a hand in this. But the argument would be, why would God raise Jesus from the dead unless it's to, to accept his message? You go, well, I don't know about that. Couldn't God do that with other religious founders? Well, he could, but he didn't. Now, I've got an I've got a article. It's on my website, GaryHaberMass.com. You can check this out. It's uh, published by a secular publisher of religious studies coming out of Cambridge University. And the name of the article is Resurrection Claims in Non-Christian Religions. And I argue that no founder of a major world religion was raised from the dead, not counting Jesus. No founder of a major world religion, even their orthodox followers, don't believe they were raised from the dead. So this is a fairly unique event. I mean, there's just no takers of the, of the, religion, of the big religion founders. If there's no takers, why, why does he get raised? Why the guy that made the most incredible claims about himself? Because you know something else? No founder of a major, major world religion claimed to be God. Buddha was probably an atheist, according to Buddhist scholars. Confucius, ethical teacher. Lao Tzu, ethical teacher. Zoroaster, prophet. Muhammad, prophet. Moses, prophet. What I mean is, none of those guys say I'm the son of God, ego of me. By the way, coming on the clouds, Mark 14, Every time that's used in the Old Testament, it's only and always used of God. Even that, which seems to be kind of innocuous, looks like it's very important. So I've got to say, nobody else made claims like this, true. Nobody else was raised from the dead, no other major founder, true. I've got to say that that act happened to him, most likely because his teachings are being confirmed. Now, if you want to come up with another view, you can do that, but I think we have the same kind of problems if you go up against the resurrection. That's just a bird's eye view. I can give you sources where I unpack this in many chapters if you want to see it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Oh, okay. Um, I have to think about how to articulate this because I think you kind of answered half my question. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. I, you just kind of answered half of my question, okay. so I have to kind of think of how to reword it. Okay. Um, but... Um, Basically, my question is that even given all of what we've just learned about the timing and the semantics and all that stuff, which I didn't know, which is very interesting. Thank you. Um, how would you tie into that? Um, well, even given all of that, I guess I don't understand how that would lead you to believe it, given that. Um, if the best evidence, if the best evidence is earned its favor, and it's really hard to come up with contrary data. I mean, nothing from that 150 years time period. What, what else should I do? Um, well, like, for example, I know this is probably the best analogy, but regardless of the, the, how good the timing was or how great of a guy Paul was and how smart he was and educated and well-learned and introspective and all that sort of thing, right. still what he claimed is so fantastical that, like, you know, if you, for example, <laughs> um, said, oh, you know, I saw Jesus yesterday, you know, even if, you know, even given that you, you know, your degrees and the decades that this has been your theme, you know, we still wouldn't necessarily believe you because that's a very fantastical thing. Yep. And how would you work into it the whole, you know, terror management theory and the human condition of needing meaning and fear of mortality? And how would that bias how everybody looks at the evidence of this as opposed to evidence, say, of Alexander the Great? Okay, so your question is something like, why should we jump on board with this thing, no matter how much evidence there is, when what we're being asked to believe is so fantastic? Yeah, and I guess kind of, too, going on the Alexander the Great thing, you know, if, if the sources are so much better for Jesus than Alexander the Great, then instead of saying, oh, well, let's believe in Jesus, maybe we should instead be saying, well, maybe we should question what we know about Alexander the Great. Question what we know. Oh, I think that's a good point. I think we should question what we know well, about Alexander the Great. Know. The earliest sources are 400 years later. I think there's some issues. Which is also really But I mean, we do know, you know about how much of the world he took, and we do know some of that. But when you get into he did this on one day, and a week later he did that, I think you probably want to rethink that. Now, on your other question, this objection is what philosophers call antecedent probability. Okay, that's big, the big, big terms. But here's basically what they mean. 
I'll illustrate it this way, and I'll illustrate it on your side of the, I'll do it on your side. The objection goes like this. If everyday events on this line look like this, these are everyday events, and you're gonna ask me if at one point in history something like this happened, which is resurrection, and then the world returns to this, I don't know what's wrong with that big point, but don't you think something's wrong since the rest of the world looks like this? Does that make sense? Does that sound like what you're asking? That's called antecedent probability. And if a guy asks me this in a debate, I mean, there's a lot of moves you can make, but, but here's probably, just to give you one, next to the resurrection, the topic that I've studied more than any other topic, I've been studying this topic for 37 years, near-death experiences. This is an incredible topic with data, so incredible that it's nearly, that as far as I can find, now others would know others, sources, but near-death experiences have been written up in at least 10 to 15 different medical journals. So that kind of tells you they break into a different domain than we normally think here. And some near-death experiences are highly evidential, extremely. I mean, I can give you some examples, but you go, really? Is this in the data? And I'd say, that particular one that I just gave you, it was written up in a journal. I and mean, you can go look it up for yourself. So it's there. Now, but, but here's, I'm just trying to make a theoretical point. If I successfully argue, if I can pull it off, that near-death experiences can be, not, not the majority of them, but there are dozens that are highly evidential, then you're arguing for a category called afterlife. That's basically where you're going. Now right away, instead of this, with resurrection, you bump up that bottom line to say, well, whatever else I know about this world, I mean, it looks like right now that there's an afterlife. So now the line's up here, and you got resurrection. Now here's what I'm saying. If we have reason to think there's an afterlife, resurrection is a specific, albeit unique, but it's a specific category in another subject that we already know to be true, if there's good evidence for it. So I would say it's not, I, I mean, this is, I understand where you're going, but if you already know there's an afterlife with good evidence. So it's in a category of blips. That, okay, yeah, because the point is, resurrection would be in a category that we already have really good evidence for. Now it takes less data to believe that this is a specific response when we know that the general phenomena could very well be true. So I mean, there's different moves I can make. I mean, another move philosophers make is to argue arguments for God's existence. And if God exists, what's it take to have a resurrection? God just has to say, I'm going to raise him. That's all it takes. So that's another way to go after it, is to argue for God. But, but in debates, I'll prefer, I prefer to go with near-death experiences, because I know the field very well. I'm, a peer, I'm a, uh, an editor for the only peer-reviewed journal that does this, and I'm the, this is interesting, I'm the Christian reviewer, because this long list of distinguished people None of the rest of them are coming from that viewpoint. This is not a religious journal. In fact, the guy that just got off the committee, who was the editor for 30 years, is a distinguished professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. So we're talking some high-level research here. So I, that's where I would go. I'd say, if we have an afterlife, now what are you going to do with resurrection? I mean, the water's hotter than it was before you started asking the question. I mean, that's the way I'd say it. Thank you. That's good food for thought. I'm sorry? So that's good food for thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, this uh, question is basically based to what you said towards the end of your speech, and I know it's a little personal, and I apologize, that's but right. you said that um, you were, it was irrelevant for you to know when you asked why. Now, it was, it's really irrelevant for me to know why my wife died. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. So yep. Um, uh, with all due respect, what I'm trying right. to ask is, uh, wouldn't uh, in all cases, wouldn't people knowing the answer why clearly, and that is what science is trying to do, it's trying to find out why and give clear-cut explanations to why these things happen. If that was the same with religion, don't you think a lot of skeptics, a lot of agnostics, people would find it more easier to come towards it, to understand that that, that answer is not coming clear? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good response. but. One of the areas I work in, I've worked with a clinical psychologist for 15 years, and we've been 
Some people think I need to go to clinical psychologists, but I've actually been doing research with this guy. I've written three books on doubt, and I'll tell you why that's relevant here. This clinical psychologist came on board to test empirically if my theory about doubt could be demonstrated empirically, empirically by definition of the psychological community. And the vast majority of doubters doubt for emotional reasons. Vast majority. I mean, as high as 70 or 80 percent. So I can tell you what happened. Somebody will say to me, and all, how many debates have you done? No, oh, about 40. I hate it, but I end up doing them all the time. I know that's my problem. Um, they'll say, how many of your opponents have ever gotten down on their knees up on the platform and said, I've had it enough, I've had enough, I want to come to God? I'll say, zero. Now, Anthony Flew, the story you heard earlier, the world's best known, Anthony Flew has written more material in favor of atheism probably than any person who's ever lived. And we debated for the first time in 1985. He became a theist or a deist in 2004. Okay? But I've never seen that happen. And people say, well, why? Does that mean your evidence is bad? Not at all. The vast majority of people, and this cuts both ways, people who believe and people who refuse to believe, they believe or fail to believe for emotional reasons. Not, you know, we don't like to hear that. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, when a man considers a message, he says, sometimes he finds a way to make a dollar that's not entirely legal. And he might take it. Other times, he might have peer pressure, and he gives in to something. And other times, I would add, he might be emotional. But Lewis says, the minute he decides not to believe, he said, here's the way the guy's going to download it. He's not going to say, well, I did something illegal. He's not going to say that. He's not going to say, well, I gave in to peer pressure. He won't say that. And he won't say, especially a guy, especially in my case, I'm German, He's not going to say, well, I was getting a little over emotional. I won't say that. Lewis says, here's what he'll say. I've been thinking. And he switches the, what Christians commonly call sin, law breaking, the peer pressure, and the emotions. He switches it to a thinking hypothesis because he wants everybody to think. He's a thinker. The vast majority, both believers and unbelievers, believe or don't believe, for emotional reasons. So I think if I had proof, the word I don't use, if I had proof, I still think that a single person up on the debate stage would follow. Because they might say, I don't like the that's we're going to I don't know, I don't like where that's going to go. Recently, one of the best known um, naturalistic philosophers in the world said, revealing quote, he said, I believe what I believe naturalism, because I don't want Christianity to be true. He said it's like the other big option, and I hate it. So I'm not going there. And I hope with all my heart I'm right. To be honest with you, that's where most people are. Believers believe for those reasons. Unbelievers, we're just human beings. And we believe for other than airtight, apodictic, certainty type arguments. So I'd say no. Even if the argument were tighter, the majority of people aren't going to come. They're going to do what they want to do. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. Thank you.